All right, it is 101. Let's go ahead and kick this off. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with your people and to be growing in your word, growing in our spiritual maturity. I just pray, Lord, that you will speak through your word and speak to us through this process. We want to be guided by you and not by men, not by ourselves, not by our own thinking, but by your your thinking. Holy Spirit, be our guide and our counselor and our instructor in this process. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that I, as the leader of this group, would not in any way mislead or um, cause any of my brothers or sisters to stumble, but instead would edify them and build them up and help assist in their growth into the full measure of the maturity of Christ. I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Okay, so uh, this week we are diving into the two resources that we recommended for you guys. Resource number one was the book, How to Study Your Bible by Kay Arthur. If you still haven't gotten that book, you can get the link to go get that book on Amazon on our Facebook page. And then, of course, The God Who Knows and Loves You, which is the study of John that we're going to go through Again, that link is also on the Facebook in the Facebook group. If you are not yet a member of our Discipleship Facebook group, make sure you become one. Just look up Scott Ross Discipleship Program on Facebook, and you'll be able to find that pretty easily. And uh, you can get those those resources. They're going to be absolutely invaluable to you, and I can't recommend it enough that you guys get those resources. So. With that said, we're going to dive into this in the order of the book and then uh, the study. And so let's dive into the book. And uh, if you've if you've got the books in front of you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be in how to study your Bible, and I'm going to be starting with the um, chapter called the joy. Uh, I'm sorry, the joy and value of inductive study, and this is. Um, right after the kind of introduction called if you want to know god's word so let's just talk about this idea of inductive study what is the concept of inductive study well inductive study as it says in the book is the use of the bible itself as the primary source of information about the bible so for instance we could study the bible by reading commentaries we could study the Bible by relying on a pastor or a preacher to preach the word to us. We could we could study the Bible by simply listening to some person's opinion about the Bible. There's a lot of different resources we could go to. We could go to Bible dictionaries, encyclopedias, etc. But what inductive study is going to do is not that it doesn't use any of those resources because at points in the process, we're going to use those resources. We're grateful that those resources exist and they're very valuable. But for the primary source about the Bible, we're going to go to the Bible itself and we're going to learn how to have the Bible interpret itself to us so that we can come away accurately interpreting the scripture. You know, in the book of Acts, there's a group of people known as the Bereans, and the Bereans were acclaimed because of their use of scripture to test what the apostles would say. When the apostles would preach, the Bereans wouldn't just accept whatever they said just because they said it. The Bereans would listen to what they said and then go back and compare that to scripture because scripture is ultimately our authority. And so how were the Bereans able to do that? How do you go to the scripture on its own if you are used to relying on a preacher to tell you what it says? I mean, if you need the preacher to tell you what it says, how can you ever know if the preacher's wrong? How can you ever com compare what the preacher has said to what the word really says and know if the preacher is accurately using the Word of God. Well, that's what we want to teach you to do. We want to teach you to be able to accurately interpret the Word of God all on your own. And when you're sitting in church on a Sunday, or when you're reading through a commentary, or you're reading a book that's made some uh, theological claim, or you know asserts something about the Bible, you're going to be able to know whether that was accurate all on your own, and it's going to become very, very powerful for you. So that's the the idea of inductive study. And so 
Inductive study has three steps that we are going to go through every time we study scripture. And we're going to use these three steps every single time. And so what are the three steps? The three steps are observation, interpretation, and application. Now, a lot of people, when they go to the Bible, they want to immediately jump to the third one, which is application. You know, we are in a time of crisis in our life or a time of need. Maybe we have fear or we have uh, something coming up. We, we've got a parenting issue with our children or a marriage issue. And so we want to just flip open the scripture and we say, you know, give me something. God, tell me something that I can apply to my life right now. Well, this is a dangerous way to come at scripture. And one thing that you'll hear me say quite frequently and that you want to write down is that any verse taken out of context becomes a pretext or can become a pretext. And what does that mean? There have been entire theological systems. There have been entire worldviews derived specifically or singularly from one line of scripture and sometimes one phrase in scripture taken out of context. We do not want to do that. We want to make sure that we interpret the Bible accurately. And so we can't accurately apply what has not been accurately interpreted. And we cannot accurately interpret unless we've done the work up front to observe. And so that's why there's three steps. Observation first, always first, then interpretation then application. So we're going to spend a good 85% of our time on the observation part. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you were a, a zoologist and you wanted to know what gorillas are really like and how they behave and why they behave a certain way. Like what causes a male gorilla to become aggressive as an example? Well, what would you need to do in order to make accurate assessments of gorilla behavior? I mean, would you go to the zoo and watch for about five minutes and then come away and write a book on how gorillas behave and why they behave the way they do? My guess would be the answer is no, uh, because you would not be correct on almost anything that you say. What would you need to do? You need to live amongst gorillas for a while. You need to just watch them under all circumstances. You need to watch them in groups. You need to watch them alone. You need to watch them with young. You need to watch them with old. You need to watch males with other males and females with other females and males with females and so forth. You would need to observe. Well, that is the case for everything if we want to be accurate in our interpretations. We need to watch. And so that's what we're going to do first with Scripture. Now, how do you observe Scripture? Well, you read it, first of all, which is something that is a foreign concept to most Christians. When we want to know what John 1.1 1, 1 says, we don't only read John 1.1. 1, 1. We've got to read the entire book of John. If we want to know what Philippians 4, 6 through 8 is really talking about, we can't just go to Philippians 4, 6 through 8. We've got to read the entire book of Philippians because Philippians was a letter. And it was written to a group of people for a reason. Imagine that I uh, am in love with my wife. Let's say we're, it's before we're married or even after we're married, I'm, I'm away on a long trip. And so I write her this really lengthy letter just sharing all of this important information from my heart. Uh, if I send her that letter, what do you think the chances would be that she would pull the letter from the envelope that she would flip maybe two pages in, scan down the page two-thirds of the way, and just pick one sentence out and read that all by itself. Would anybody read a letter that way? And if they did, would they have any idea what the writer of the letter is really talking about? Of course not. I mean, what if she fell upon the phrase, I hate everything about that? Man, that's a really negative phrase. Well, what if that's in the context of me hating that I'm away from her? Well, that changes things, doesn't it? See, we've got to read the letter as a letter because that's how it was written. All of these books in the New Testament were written with a purpose. And so the only way we're going to know what they really say is we've got to read 
the entire thing. Another way we observe is we look for repeated words and phrases because this was a, a verbal culture. They were used to handing down tradition and stories and history verbally, and they were very, very good at it. They are not like us. They were so used to doing this that it wasn't like the telephone game that we have today. When they would hand down history or tradition or scripture, they did so very accurately. And so one of the things they did to make something memorable or to emphasize a point would be to repeat words and phrases. So if you see a word or phrase repeated, it's a sign to us. This is a really important concept. And so we're going to make note of those words and phrases. In fact, we're going to mark them with a unique marking so that they're easily found when we want to go back and interpret. You're going to feel a little bit like a kindergartner with your coloring in your scripture because you'll be highlighting and coloring and making little symbols and drawing little figurines. The reason we do that is because, for instance, in the book of John, one of our repeated phrases is the word. We see the, the word said over and over again. Well, we want to go back and say, what did we learn about the word? Well, instead of having to read it 50 or 60 times, we read through it one time. Then we read through it a second time and specifically mark. And then we can just go straight to those markings. We can easily see everywhere we've marked the phrase, the word, and we can learn what, or we can observe what we see about that phrase. You know, what did we learn about the author? What did we learn about major characters? And this re re leads to another way that we observe. We use the classic journalistic questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we bring those questions to the scripture. Who is talking? Who are they talking to? Why are they writing? What are they talking about? When was this written? Where was it written? Where the, were the recipients when it was written to them, um, etc. We're going to ask those key questions about the scripture. So we're going to observe. And then the, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to make a lot of lists. And the lists are critical. I will just tell you. Um, we, for instance, one of the things you could do right now is start a journal, and there are three journals that you're going to want to start at a minimum, and this is one. Uh, these are called the Journal on God, the Journal on Christ, and the Journal on the Holy Spirit. And as you're reading, let's say we're studying the Book of John right now, you're going to learn a lot of things about. God the Father. You're going to learn a lot of things about God the Son or Christ. You're going to learn a lot of things about God the Holy Spirit. And so you're going to start making a journal that lists all those things that you learned because you can go back and just read that list. And it's very edifying to reread everything you learned as truths about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But it goes way beyond that, you know, it, within a given book you're studying, there's other things that you're going to want to list. So, for instance, you might learn list everything you learned about John. You might list everything you learned about miracles. You might list everything you learned about, um, I don't know, the recipients of a given book. The point is you're going to want to create lists of everything that you learn. Um, it's going to make the observation part just come alive for you. Another thing that the, the um, so let me just skip to uh, steps two and three, and then we're going to dive into two and three in more detail as we go through the book, How to Study Your Bible, because we've been talking about observation. Once we properly, properly observe, we're then going to have an easy interpretation. See, a lot of people read the Bible and they're so confused. They're like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't, I can't make heads or tails of it. Well, the reason they can't make heads or tails of it is because they're trying to interpret first. If you spend all your time on the observation part, the interpretation becomes very, very simple and you almost always get it right. Like, okay, list everything you learned about Christ. 
got that. Okay, I totally get it. Now let's interpret what we've learned. Well, we've done such a great job observing that the interpretation naturally flows out of that. And like I said, we'll get into interpretation in more detail because that's the next chapter of the book. The third and final part is the application. And this is what everybody really wants. They really want to apply it to their life. And again, if we've observed and spent plenty of time on that, the interpretation is simple. And then the application becomes even simpler. You'll always get the application part right. Now, I want to focus on something that is in the book, and that is the idea of observing the obvious, observing the obvious. In my discipleship program, and as you're going to see here as we go through this, I will ask questions, and a lot of times the the students they want to they 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 feel like the answer must be something super spiritual or philosophical or, or esoteric so for instance you know i might be um asking about you know john i don't know 1 9 that says the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And I'll say, what does this tell us about the light? And then they'll be like, well, um, you know, it's light is where there's no darkness and there's, you know, and they want to come up with something that's super philosophical, not what we're looking for. It says the true light. So what does that tell us? There is a true light. Light can have truth to it, which gives light to everyone. So it, it tells us that the true light gives light to who? Everyone. Does it give light to only a small portion of the people? No. Does it give light to a select group of people? No. It gives light to who? Everyone. And what else? Was coming into the world. So there was a time when the light actually showed up in the world. There was a time then it wasn't in the world. The true light was coming into the world. See, those are three obvious facts about light that we learn from verse nine. And so I just want to encourage you when you're doing your questions and answers, don't overcomplicate it. Don't try to make it some hyper spiritualized, hyper philosophical answer. What does it actually say? That's what we're looking for in the interpretation section or, or process of the inductive study method. And then, of course, it talks about reading with purpose. We already talked about that uh, in the who, what, when, where, why, and how. One last thing is uh, I skipped over, but this is absolutely critical, and that is you always study the Scripture having prayed about it. We're not doing a study on the Holy Spirit right now, but I will tell you, if you study the Holy Spirit, one of the things you'll learn about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is referred to as our counselor and as our teacher throughout scripture. The Holy Spirit, it says spiritual things are spiritually discerned and the Holy Spirit enlightens our spirit to the truth. Without the Holy Spirit as our guide, we will never completely understand scripture. And so we always want to begin by praying and asking God to illuminate us to what he's about to, to, to what we're about to read, to be our instructor, to be our guide. We don't need another instructor because we have the ultimate instructor, the author of the scriptures himself, the Holy Spirit. So that is the observation or, or just a, an initial touch on, you know, what you've read through chapter one, which is, you know, inductive study is using the Bible to interpret the Bible. There are three steps observation, interpretation, and then application. And then what is observation about? It's about getting things in context. It's about reading with purpose, looking for the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And it's about making lists and, and looking for the obvious. So with that said, um, is there any questions that you guys have just specifically about the inductive study method or what we've covered through chapter one of the book? before we dive into our study in the book of John. Any questions about that? You can unmute and ask. And if there's no questions, you can say, you can say silent or type no questions and we'll move on. I just want to give you an opportunity.
Okay, cool. Let's move on. So now we're going to dive into our study of the book of John. And um, this is that book, The God Who Cares and Knows You. And uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to be on day seven of your book, which is the questions for discussion or individual study. And if you've done the study, you'll uh, have no problem answering these questions or getting involved in these questions. But um, it says store in your heart, John 1, 1 and John 1, 14. And I recommend that you do that. But we also are actually, um, last week we had a scripture memory question or scripture memory assignment. And that scripture memorization assignment was for New Life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So I want to know if any of you have uh, the guts, if you will, to see if you can say 2 Corinthians 5.17 from memory for the group. Anybody want to challenge themselves to do that? If so, unmute your line. Let's hear it. All right. Well, I will encourage you to make sure you memorize 2 Corinthians 5.17. New Life in Christ is our tagline. So we would say, New Life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17. All right, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. I'll give this a shot. New life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Behold, the new has come. Beautiful. Second. Outstanding. Yeah, and I'm sorry to cut you off there. You're doing the right thing. You always want to put the scripture reference again at the end, and that's that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, man. So everybody, make sure you memorize that. Um, the next one we're going to memorize this week is we're going to memorize same tagline, New Life in Christ. And this week it's Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. 20 and uh, let me just tell you what that says in the esv since that's what we're memorizing uh it says i've been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me and the life i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me galatians 2 20 i'll say it again new life in christ galatians 2 20 i've been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and the life i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. So make sure that you guys memorize now 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 2.20. Uh, both are going to have the tagline, New Life in Christ. Next week, we will move to a, a second tagline that will give you another hook for conversations you're having with people out in the world. Okay, so let's dive into... Um, these questions for discussion. Who can tell me what the purpose of the Gospel of John is? If your mic, if you don't have a mic, you could also type the answer if you'd like in the comment section. Well, I will tell you it is found in John 20, 30, and 31. And it says this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Excellent, Richard. That's exactly right. So here's the deal with John. He's saying here there was a lot of other things that went down in Jesus's life. I mean, he did a ton of stuff. And I'm not trying to list all that stuff here. I'm listing some things here with one concept in mind, that when you understand these accounts, these miracles that I'm going to give you, 
you're going to know Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah, is what he's saying there. He's the Son of God. And by believing that, you may have life in his name. So we've got four Gospels. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of them are written for a different purpose. All of them are trying to achieve something specific. You know, there's different miracles and different stories that occur across the four Gospels. But the book of John is specifically trying to give you, without question, evidence that Christ or that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, and so that believing you may have life in his name. So when we read these different miraculous accounts, as we're about to find out, they were very strategically chosen by John. They were specifically picked because they had really profound meaning for the first century reader. And we're going to dive into what those meanings are as we get into each account. But just understand, this was not willy-nilly, let me just pick some stories or let me just tell you everything that happened. Neither of those is true. It was, I'm going to hand pick the miracles and the accounts of the three years I spent with Christ. I'm going to hand pick the ones that are going to deliver the most robust assurance to the reader that this guy was who he said he was. He was God in the flesh. The other reason that this is important to note is that John's accounts are not necessarily chronological. He wasn't trying to show you what Jesus had what Jesus's ministry looked like from beginning to end. Instead, he just is picking seven very critical accounts throughout his his testimony here that would demonstrate to the reader that Jesus is actually the Messiah. And so, therefore, he's not trying to line it up with Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Um, he's not trying to make sure that it follows chronological order. None of that is in his mind. He's just picking seven stories, um, and I keep saying seven. We haven't gotten into that. But he's picking stories that are going to specifically deliver to the reader proof that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. So with that said, let's look at John 1, 1 through 18. And what do we, there's two people that are, there's two characters, if you will, in the story in John 1, 1 through 18 that are very, very prominent. Who can tell me what those two characters are or who those two characters are? Yes, Jesus and John the Baptist. That is correct. Now, what do we learn in that first section that demonstrates that Jesus is actually deity, that he's actually God? He's actually, as it says here, the Son of God, which is a, a, a synonym for God in this in this time frame in this time period and we'll we'll probably study that later but what evidence do you see that jesus is actually the son of god let's just stick to g john chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 right now exactly it says in the beginning was the word and the word was what with God and the word what was God. So, by the way, we're going to start to see Trinitarian references very, very early here. We've got this person called the word who is both with God from the beginning and was God from the beginning. He, referring pronoun, referring to the word, was in the beginning with God. Okay, what do we learn next that tells us that this person, the Word, is God or the Son of God? And here again, and, and I, I love that you guys are typing answers, and I'm not criticizing your answers, but I'm going to go through, go back to the, the point I made earlier, which is, we want to observe the obvious. We don't want to come up with our own answer. The scripture is going to tell us exactly what we're asking for. So let's just look at exactly what it says. And um, 
Todd and Karen, you're absolutely right. It says in verse two, he was in the beginning and then all things were made through him. And just to make this clear, what? Without him, nothing that has been made was made. <laughs> so the only things that this guy made was the stuff that's been made. <laughs> nothing that hasn't been made, he made. But everything that's been made, he made. Yes, and then the next thing in him is life. Now, I'll just give you a little apologetic here. If you go ask a scientist to define the substance of life, they cannot do it. See, if we just want to think as a secular humanist, and we want to believe that we came together through random chance, and we're just a clump of cells, if I give you a cadaver, a dead human, all the cells are identical to a living human. The cells are all there. The organs are all there. The structures are all there. What's missing? There's something called life. What is that stuff? Where does it come from? Where do you go get life? Could you put it in a bottle? Can you drink it? No. Once life is gone, it's gone. Where did it come from? Where does it go? This is a question that a scientist has zero answer for, but we as Christians do because it says in him was life and the life was the light of men. When you look in a live person, you see a light in their eye. When somebody is like, I was in the military and we had this dude in our barracks and he had this really creepy thing. He would sleep with his eyes open. It was super bizarre. And you could go look at him, and his, he's laying there sound asleep, but his eyes were slightly open. And we used to say, man, his, his eyes look dead. There didn't seem to be any life there. When we know that God holds the keys to life and death, and in this person the word was life. And that life was the light of men. Okay, what else do we see? So the word is called the light. So we got a synonym there. So now we know that the light and the word are the same person. And then when we get to verse 9, what do we see? The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Aha, uh -huh. exactly right. So what did it tell us about the light? It, it, there was an event that happened. What event was that? It's at the very end of verse 9. Yes. Exactly right, Bradley. It came into the world. So we have a moment in time when this being that we're talking about, this being that was in the beginning with God and also was God and that has made all things and that nothing that's been made was made without him and that also holds life in his hands. In him was life. He is the source of life that that being came into the world at a singular point in time. Now, what's interesting is it says in verse 10, what? He was in the world, but the, yeah, the world didn't know him, but more importantly, the world was made through him. Exactly right. The world was made through him. Man, this is a crazy situation we've got here. We've got a person that actually made the world and then actually came into the world. So the, whoever made whoever this person was that we're talking about here, he's in the world that he actually made. He stepped into space and time, but the world didn't know him. 
He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who is of Jewish heritage, and he was saying, you know, uh, we were talking about, you know, the Jew, Jewish people and their rejection of the Messiah. And I've been to Israel and I've had lengthy discussions with, uh, you know, orthodox or seemingly orthodox Jewish people. And they say, well, you know, we would have known if the Messiah came. And I say to them, what does the Old Testament say the Jewish people would do to the Messiah? And they say, we'll reject him. And I say, okay. And so what's your argument again? Oh, well, we know the scripture so well that we would know him. Okay, let me ask you again. What did you say the, the Old Testament says the Jewish people would do to the Messiah? Reject him. So you say, you're telling me that the prophecy was that the, old, the Jews would reject the Messiah, but your argument for why Jesus isn't the Messiah is that you would know that it was him. See, his own people didn't receive him. This is a fulfillment of scripture. Okay, but to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, what happens? become children yeah they have the right to become children of god he gave them the right to become children of god who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god so this is the question that you have there in day seven of your book how do you become a child of god That's right. You believe in his name. So if somebody asks you, how do I become a child of God? How do I know that I'm going to heaven? What would your answer be? Yes, believe in the name of Jesus. Now, this is a very important point. The Jesus that we're believing in is the Jesus of John 1. So what if somebody says to you that Jesus isn't God? I, what if they say, I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe he was God. Is that acceptable? Are you really believing in Jesus at that point? Yeah, exactly. No. So we have cults. That will tell you, oh, I believe the same thing you do. The Mormons will tell you they believe in Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you believe in Jesus. In fact, the Hindus will tell you they believe in Jesus and that Jesus is God. They'll say he's God. Yeah, I believe that. So what's the problem here? You know, um, even Muslims will tell you to a degree they believe in Jesus. In fact, the Quran holds Jesus in very, very high esteem. The issue is is they deny the truths we're seeing here in John 1. It's not the Jesus of Scripture that they actually believe in. They don't believe that he was God. They don't believe that he made all things. They don't believe he gave light to everyone. They deny these ingredients of his character. That you know They believe he was either an angel or just another human. Uh, who led a pretty good life. They believe he was a prophet. Uh, with the Hindus, Hindus believe in, in pantheism. They believe that, it, you know, pantheism and polytheism both, uh, they have this weird blend where they believe that all things are God and there are many gods. In fact, there are millions of gods. There has been a joke that there are more gods in India than actual people in India. And so it's very simple for them to say, oh, well, yeah, he's God because there's a million gods, and he just happens to be one of them. This is not what we learn in John 1. And so if they say they believe the same things, they don't, because they deny these critical elements of Jesus' character. Does that make sense to you guys? Awesome. 
So, who then is this other character we've got here in this discussion? We've talked about Christ. We know that it's Christ, by the way, because it gets through that when it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we know that we're talking about Jesus at that point. So who is the other character we've got here in our first chapter? Yeah, that's right. John the Baptist. So what do we learn about John the Baptist from chapter 1, verses 1 through 27? Yep, he was sent to prepare the way. It starts in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Was John the Baptist the light himself? No. It says there he was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. So let me ask you this. What function does witnessing have? Yeah, it's a good way to say it. Expose people to the light. What else? Yeah, testifying to give credibility to or credence to. See, this is where the mystery really lies with Christianity and with the way that God's chosen to interact with us. And that mystery is that there's this partnership between God and man in the revelation of truth to mankind. I mean, God could have chosen to do this a lot of ways, and he's infinitely wise. He's perfect. He makes all all of his judgments are perfect and without um, any openness to question. And so for whatever reason that we don't even really understand, I mean, to me, it seems like this way more effective way to do this because I personally am super unreliable. I mean, I would never rely on me for something this important. But for whatever reason, God, he decided to, engage us and partner with us in pointing people to his son and pointing people to the truth. And we can't bring about the harvest. We can't bring about eternal life. There's nothing I can do to give a person eternal life or to ensure that a person goes to heaven rather than goes to hell. There's nothing I can do about that. All I can do is be a messenger that points people to Christ. But for whatever reason, in his infinite wisdom, God has condescended to partner with us. And so we have this amazing privilege. We have been honored in this amazing way that we get to testify and draw people to Christ. And it is the only mechanism, really, that God has outlined through Scripture to bring people to Christ. It says in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. How can they believe who have not heard? And how can they hear if there is no one to preach to them. It's this unbelievable um, fact that God chose to work through us and with us in the salvation of souls. And so testifying, we see how critical being a testimony and being a witness is right from the beginning. Even at the very beginning, God sends a witness to be a forebearer for him to go out and be a voice crying in the wilderness, make way uh, the path of the Lord. So, 
I'll just ask you, how seriously do you take your your role as a partner with God in pointing people to his son? How frequently do you uh, testify? How frequently do you make that gesture of going, hey, you got to go look at this guy, this guy over here. That's good, Brad. I'm so glad to hear that. Based on what you're seeing here and what we're studying, how seriously do you think you might want to take it starting today? Awesome. So let's go back to the purpose that we see here on the screen. What is the significance of signs and wonders being done in the presence of the disciples, do you think? Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. Proof of the supernatural. See, let's just be be real. I mean, if a guy shows up in our neighborhood claiming that he's God, we're probably going to walk on the other side of the street from that guy. We're probably going to avoid that guy. So there had to be some outward manifestation of his supernatural power so that people knew he was really who he said he was. And so Jesus made it quite easy for the disciples and for everyone around him to know that he truly was who he said he was by doing what only someone who was God could do. You know, we're going to study some of his miracles, but, you know, if for instance, he makes wine from water. Well, it, it's not the simple wine from water thing because the wine he made was the best wine. It was the most delicious wine they had tasted. It was the finest wine. Well, what that de demonstrates is not just simply like some sort of, you know, super uh, spiritual alchemy where I had one kind of liquid and now I have another kind of liquid. Rather, it demonstrates that he controls space and time because the only way for wine to be good is for it to be aged. So he was able to age something instantly. You know, some people say, well, there's certain parts of the world that seem old. Yeah, the wine they drank seemed old too. Christ can make something old instantly because he controls space and time. That's what the making the wine out of the water really demonstrated. It had nothing to do with I have one liquid and now I have another liquid in this a cool magic trick. It is I control time itself. That is something only deity can do. He raised the dead back to life. Something only deity can do. He made all things. And as it says in Colossians, he holds all things together. He literally controls the subatomic level of the universe. So when he walks on water, he does what only deity can do because he's controlling the atomic structure of his body in interaction with the, the water. So this is why he had to do the signs. He had to demonstrate to them, I am who I say I am, so that they would have no doubt and could go out and testify with passion and fervor and with, with nothing holding them back. So with that said, we've got only a few minutes left. I would just ask you, what is how do you apply this to your life? And I want to ask you very candidly, and you don't have to answer to the public if you don't want to because everybody's seeing your answer, but are you really a child of God right now as we're sitting here on this webinar? Have you been adopted as a child? And if so, if you think you are, how do you know that you have been? How do you know that you're going to heaven?
Tom, I agree with that comment. Tom said, can you imagine this says he did many other signs? These were the ones written for us to believe. Yeah, it would have been amazing to be with Christ those three years. Absolutely phenomenal to see all the things he did that we don't even have documented today. I would ask you guys that to, to meditate on that question. Are you a child of the king? Are you a child of God? Are you going to heaven? If you think you are, how do you know for sure? We had it shown to us right here in this study how we can know for sure that we're saved, that we're a child of God. And the last thing is, how does this study motivate you? What do you what do you plan on doing this week that you didn't do last week? That's awesome, Anna. That's exactly right. Amen, Tom. As you guys are thinking about the gospel for yourselves and thinking about your own eternal life and as you're thinking about it for others, here's what I want you to really understand. I want you to grasp there's a single word that I want you to always have at the forefront of your mind, and I'm typing it there in the comment section, and that word is the word trust. Trust. You see, we're all trusting in something. For our eternal life. We're all trusting in something. If you ask people on the street. Are you going to heaven? 99% of them will say yes. And if you say how do you know? Why are you going to heaven? They will tell you an answer. And that answer is what they are trusting in. For most of them. They're trusting in something other. Than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're trusting in something other than the finished work of Christ on the cross. They will tell you things like, I'm a pretty good person. They will tell you what they haven't done wrong, like, well, I've never murdered or raped anybody. They will tell you things like, well, I, you know, I, I try to go to church. They'll tell you things they do. They'll either tell you things they didn't do, like I didn't murder anybody, or they'll tell you things they do, like, well, I've been going to church since I was a kid. I serve in the Sunday school. Um, you know, they'll tell you my dad was a preacher. They'll tell you that they came down the aisle at youth camp. They will say these sorts of things. None of these things get you saved. What gets you saved is believing on the name of Jesus. And believing doesn't mean intellectually assenting to his historical reality. It's not saying, well, I believe in Jesus like, yeah, I knew he was there. Like, I've got this cup. I believe this cup is here. It's not that I say it really happened, that he really came. It's that I am trusting in what he has done for me rather than trusting in what I can do for myself. And so as you think about your salvation and as you talk with other people about their salvation, this idea of trust is I, what I want to be the centerpiece of that conversation. What are you trusting in, relying upon to get to heaven? If it's anything but the finished work of Christ, Scripture says you're not going to go to heaven. It is only the finished work of Christ and trusting in that work that can get us to heaven. So keep that in mind. Well, with that said, do we have any final questions about this week's study? Uh, because of time, I want to keep it on this week's study rather than random theology questions. But if you have any questions about this week's study, um, throw it out there, and we'll try to address it in our last two minutes together before we wrap up. Awesome, guys. Well, listen, let's just recap your um, your homework um, this week. It is read chapter two of how to study your Bible. Do week two of your study of, the, of John and memorize Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, my new life, new life in Christ, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20.
and that's the NIV version, but uh, you guys will memorize it in the ESV, which is very similar. So with that said, guys, God bless you. I will see you again on Tuesday, 1 o'clock Central Time. Get your friends and family into our group and get them on this discipleship program. Let's raise people up. Till then, God bless you guys. Bye-bye.